Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness shall overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light shatter the darkness and illumine your church. Beloved people of God, welcome to this, our unconventional worship service, for this, the third midweek service in Lent. Our focus for today's worship is the phrase from our Christ hymn from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians. At the name of Jesus, all knees shall bend. Our Old Testament reading today is from the book of First Kings. And before we start, I have a wonderful summary of the books of First and Second Kings from a group called The Bible Project. I strongly encourage you to look them up. They do some wonderful, wonderful things. And it will give you a little bit more context for this particular passage. The books of the first, first and second, second kings. kings, although they're although two they're separate, two separate books, books in our Bibles, Bibles they, were they were originally written, written as one book, book telling, telling a unified story, story that, continues that continues on from, from the book of the Samuel, Samuel that came before it. it. So, David so David has unified, unified the tribes of Israel, Israel into a kingdom, and God, and God promised, promised that from his line, line would come a messianic king, king who would establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill the promises made to Abraham. So the book of Kings tells the story of the long line of kings that came after David, and none of them lived up to that promise. In fact, in fact, they run they the run nation, nation of Israel, Israel right, right into the into ground. ground. The book is the designed, book is designed to, have to have five main, main movements. movements. The story, the story begins, begins and ends, ends focus on Jerusalem. on Jerusalem. First, with Solomon's, Solomon's reign and the construction of the temple, of the temple. And, then and then in this, in this last, last section, ending, ending with Jerusalem's, Jerusalem's destruction and Israel's, and Israel's exile to Babylon. To Babylon. And, the and the story leading, leading up, to up to this tragedy is what is makes what up the center three sections, which explain how Israel split into two rival kingdoms, how God tried to prevent the corruption of Israel by sending the prophets, and how exile became the unavoidable consequence of Israel's, of Israel's sin. sin. The, book the book opens, opens with, two with two chapters, chapters about, the about the kingdom passing, passing from the aging David to his son Solomon. Solomon. And, David's and David's final words to Solomon, words to Solomon they're very they're similar, similar to those of Moses, Moses and Joshua, and Samuel, and Samuel to, the to the people. It's a call, it's a call to, to remain faithful, faithful to the commands of the covenant, of the covenant and, and to give allegiance, allegiance to the God of Israel alone. But David's words ring somewhat hollow here because David and Solomon then go on to conspire how they're going to consolidate this new kingdom through a whole series of political assassinations, not off to a great start. Solomon's, Solomon's brightest, brightest moment, moment comes, comes when he asks when he God, asks God for, wisdom for wisdom to lead Israel. Israel. And, he and he even completes, completes David's, David's dream to make a, make a temple, temple for the God, for the God of, Israel. of Israel. Here the story, Here the story actually stops, stops and describes the design, the design of this temple in detail, detail. Just, just like, like the, tabernacle the tabernacle design, design in, the in the Torah. There's all, There's all this gold and jewels and depictions of angels and fruit trees. It's all symbolism echoing back to the Garden of Eden. It's the place where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells with his people. But no sooner does Solomon finish the temple, the temple that he makes, he makes really, really horrible, horrible choices, choices and the kingdom, and the kingdom falls, falls apart. apart. He, starts he starts marrying, marrying the, daughters the daughters of other kings, other kings hundreds, hundreds of them, for political, political alliances. alliances. And, then and then he adopts, he adopts their, their gods, and gods and introduces the worship, the worship of those gods, gods into, into Israel. Israel. Solomon, Solomon then, then accumulates, accumulates huge amounts of wealth. wealth. He, builds he builds a huge army. He even institutes slave labor for all of his building projects. Now if you go back to the Torah and look at God's guidelines for Israel's king, Deuteronomy 17, Solomon is breaking breaking every, every one. one. So by the so time, by the time that, that he dies, dies Solomon, Solomon resembles Pharaoh, Pharaoh the, king the king of Egypt, Egypt more, than, more he than he does his father, father David. David. The next, the section, the next of section of the book opens, opens with Solomon's with son, Rehoboam, Rehoboam acting, acting just, just like his, like his father. father. It's a very it's sad, sad story of greed and lust for power. power. He tries to increase taxes for slave labor. And under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes reject this, they rebel and secede, and form their own rival kingdom. And so now in the story, you have the southern Southern kingdom, kingdom Judah, Judah, centered, centered in, Jerusalem, in Jerusalem with kings, with kings from, the from the line of David, David. And, now and now this new this northern, northern kingdom, kingdom called, called Israel, whose capital, whose capital will, will be Samaria, Samaria eventually. eventually. Jeroboam, Jeroboam also, goes also goes on to build two, two new temples, temples to, compete to compete with Solomon's, with Solomon's temple in the, in the south. south. He puts, he puts a golden, a golden calf, calf in each one to represent the God of Israel. The connection to Exodus 32 and the golden calf, it's all quite explicit. 
From this point on, the story goes back and forth, and forth from north, north to, south, to south, tracing, tracing the, fate the fate of both, of both kingdoms. kingdoms. Each, one each one had about, had about 20, 20 successive kings, kings. And, as and as the author introduces, introduces each king, he evaluates their reign by a few criteria. criteria. Did they worship, did they worship the, God the God of Israel alone, or did, did they promote the worship of other gods? Other gods? Did they deal did with idolatry among the people? And did they remain faithful to the covenant like David, or do they become corrupt and unjust? And according to these criteria, the author finds no good kings in northern, northern, northern Israel, Israel, 0 for 20. 20. And then in and then southern, southern Judah, Judah, only 8 out of 20, out of 20 get a positive, positive rating, rating. Which, connects which connects to another huge, huge purpose, purpose in this book. book. And, that's and that's to introduce, introduce the, role the role of the prophets, prophets key, key figures, figures in Israel's, in Israel's history. history. So, in the, so Bible, in the Bible, prophets, prophets, were, not prophets were, not were not fortune tellers. tellers. Rather, they, Rather they, spoke they spoke on behalf of the God of Israel, and they played the role of covenant watchdogs, which means they called out idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. They were constantly reminding Israel of their calling to be a light, to, be a light to, the nations, to the nations, that they should, that they should obey, obey the commands the of, the of the Torah, and so the, so prophets, the prophets challenged, challenged Israel, Israel to repent and, and follow their God. God. In, these in these center sections, sections for, each for each king, God then God raises, raises up prophets, prophets to hold them hold accountable. Them accountable. And the most prominent, the most prominent prophets, prophets are the northern, northern ones, ones, Elijah and his disciple Elisha, right here in the center of the book. Elijah was a wild man of a prophet, living out in the desert, and his arch nemesis was the northern king Ahab and his Canaanite wife Jezebel. Together, these two had instituted, instituted the, worship the worship of the Canaanite, of the Canaanite god, god Baal, Baal over, over Israel. Israel. And, so and so in a so famous, in famous story, Elijah, Elijah challenged 450 prophets, prophets of Baal to a contest, contest to see which god, which god was, real. was real. So they both so they built, built altars, altars and prayed to their, prayed their, gods, their gods, but only the god, god of Israel, Israel answers, answers with fire. With fire. After, After this, this Ahab, Ahab uses his, his royal power, power to murder an Israelite farmer and then steal his family's vineyard. And Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice, and he announces the downfall of his house. House. Elijah, eventually Elijah eventually passes, passes the, mantle the mantle of his prophetic, of his prophetic leadership, leadership to a young, to a young disciple, disciple named Elisha, named Elisha who, asks who asks for two, two times, times the authority of Elijah. Of Elijah. And, what's and what's fascinating here is how the author, author he's, recounted he's recounted seven, seven miraculous, miraculous feats, feats for Elijah, for Elijah. And, then and then he offers, he offers stories of 14 acts, acts of power, power from Elijah. From Elijah. Both prophets, Both prophets were clearly, clearly remarkable, remarkable men, men, and they played, and they played the, same the same role, confronting Israel's, Israel's kings, kings for idolatry, for idolatry and, injustice. and injustice, and ultimately, and they were they unsuccessful in turning Israel, Israel back, back from apostasy. From apostasy. In the next section, section, the northern, northern kingdom, kingdom is rocked by a, by a bloody revolution, revolution started by a king, by a king named Jehu, Jehu who, destroys who destroys Ahab's, Ahab's family. family. And although, and although Jehu, Jehu was at was first commissioned, commissioned by God, his, his violence, violence just gets, just gets out, out of control, of control. and it creates, it creates the spiral, spiral of political assassinations and rebellions, and rebellions from which, from which Israel, Israel never, never recovered. recovered. Coup, coup follows coup, coup after, after Jehu, and each king follows other gods, allows horrible injustice. It all leads up to 2 Kings chapter 17. The big bad empire, empire of Assyria, of Assyria swoops, swoops down and takes, takes out the northern, northern kingdom, kingdom altogether. altogether. And, the and the capital city, city of Samaria, of Samaria is, conquered, is conquered, and the Israelites, and the Israelites are exiled and scattered, and scattered throughout, throughout the ancient world. world. Now, chapter, now, chapter 17, 17 is key. Is key. The, author the author stops, stops the, story the story and offers and this prophetic, prophetic reflection on what's, on what's just happened. happened. He, blames he blames the downfall, the downfall of the northern, northern kingdom, kingdom on the idolatry and covenant unfaithfulness of Israel and its kings. And so God has allowed them to face the consequences of their decisions. The final, the final movement, movement of the book of the tells, tells the story, the story of, the of the lone southern, southern kingdom. kingdom. And here, and here we, meet we meet some very heroic, very heroic kings, kings, like Hezekiah, like Hezekiah who, trusts who trusts God when the armies of Assyria come knocking, knocking on Jerusalem's door. door. Or, or Josiah, Josiah who, discovers who discovers this lost, this lost scroll, scroll of the Torah, of the Torah in, the in the temple. So he starts, so he starts reading, reading it. He's convicted, and he institutes religious reforms to remove idolatry and Canaanite influences from the land. But, but Judah, Judah is just, is just too, far too far gone. gone. The king, the king right, right in between, in between these, these two, Manasseh, Manasseh he's, the he's the worst by far. By far. So, he so he not only, he not only introduces, introduces the, worship the worship of idol statues, statues into, into the, the Jerusalem, Jerusalem temple, temple, he also, he also institutes, institutes child, child sacrifice. sacrifice. And, so and so God sends, sends prophets, prophets to say, to say the, time the time is up. Is up. Israel, Israel has, has reached the point of no return. The final chapters tell the story of the Babylonian Empire coming to invade Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry the people and the royal line of David, David off, off into, into exile. exile. And so the, and so the story, story ends, ends leaving, leaving us wondering, wondering is, God is God done with, done with Israel? Israel? Is he done is he with the done line of David? David? Well, the, well final the final paragraph zooms, zooms about 40, 40 years forward, forward into, into the exile, the exile and it tells, it tells a, very a very odd story. story. It's about Jehoiakim, a, a descendant from David, who would have been king if he was back in 
back, back into Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And, the and the king of Babylon, Babylon releases, releases him from prison, him from prison and, invites and invites him to eat, eat at the royal, royal table, table for the rest, for the rest of, his of his life, and the book, and ends. The book ends. So it's not, so it's not much, but it's a story, story that, gives that gives a glimmer, a glimmer of, hope, of hope that God, that God has, has not abandoned the line of David. So the question now is, how is God going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, to David? How is he going to bless the nations and bring the messianic kingdom? And to answer those questions, you have to read on into the wisdom and the prophetic books. But for now, that's the book of Kings. So that's the book of First Kings and Second Kings. I think that it is helpful to have all of that background information so that this passage is put a little bit more into context. Um, it can be really difficult to understand, especially um, as we get toward the end, but um, I think that it's important to understand that this was Elijah's way of trying to prevent the downfall of the people. So our first lesson is from the book of First Kings, the 18th chapter, beginning with the 30th verse. Then Elijah said to the people, come closer to me. And all the people came closer to him. First, he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the world to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar, large enough to contain two measures of seed. Next, he put the wood in order and cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. He said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time, and they did it a second time. Then he said, do it a third time, and they did it a third time, so that the water ran all around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering, the prophet Elijah came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known that this day you are God in Israel, and that I am that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all of these things at your bidding. Answer me, O God, answer me so that your people may know that you, O Lord, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood and stones and the dust and even licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord indeed is God, the Lord indeed is God. Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, do not let one of them escape. Then they seized them and Elijah brought them down to Wadi Kaisan and killed them there. The word of the Lord. Because our psalm is copyrighted, is copyrighted out of Holden Evening Prayer, I'm unable to produce it here, but you can look up Holden Evening Prayer online. There are a number of people who have recorded portions of it. Instead, I'll read the psalm that the hymn is based on. This is Psalm 141. A prayer for preservation from evil, a Psalm of David. I call upon you, O Lord, come quickly to me, give ear to my voice when I call to you. Let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting up of my hands as an evening sacrifice. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord, and keep watch over the door of my lips. Do not turn my heart to any evil, to busy me myself with wicked deeds in company of those who work in inequity. Do not let me eat of the delicacies. Let the righteous strike me, let the faithful correct me. Never let the oil of the wicked anoint my head, for my prayer is continually against their wicked deeds. 
When they are given over to those who shall condemn them, then they shall learn that my words were pleasant. Like a rock that one breaks apart and shatters on the land, so shall their bones be strewn at the mouth of Sheol. But my eyes are turned toward you, O God, my Lord. In you I seek refuge. Do not leave me defenseless. Keep me from the trap that they have laid for me and the snares of the evildoers. Let the wicked fall into their own nets while I escape alone. Our second reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter two, starting with the fifth verse. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue can, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Beloved people of God, grace and peace to you from God. Amen. I will be the first to say that as I see our congregations and our communities struggling with the new normal that we have encountered, I have some moments that I'm disheartened. COVID-19 does have a long reach and there are now confirmed cases in every state of the nation. And it's difficult to know exactly what will happen next. And as we learn more, as we exercise caution, and we do the best we can to contain the quick spread of the illness, I know very little about what will happen next week or next month. At First Lutheran Church or any of our ministry partners close to home and around the globe, all I can tell you for certain is that even with all of this, God is present. God is with us in the midst of every uncertainty, every anxiety, and every difficulty. It has been a little difficult this week for me to think of a world where every knee shall bend to Christ when around me I'm seeing a world that seems a little cut off at its knees. But thankfully, I can get that view from scripture, which is what we see in our Old Testament reading today. Here is a place where God's people have turned away to worship Baal. But nothing, not anything will keep them from God or will keep God from them. God will, in fact, bring fire from the skies and perform miracles to bring you back after you've turned away. But God will never forget or abandon us. And this is indeed a reason that every knee should bend at the name of Jesus. Amen. The hymn that we would have been sharing in person is Beneath the Cross of Jesus. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor 
and give you peace. Amen.